There is one little corner case for exports that is the reason that we had more complicated bound imports before. So normally, with these normal imports, with these normal exports rather, you're giving a big list of all the strings of the names of the stuff you export, and you're giving RVAs. These RVAs are within your own module space. Okay. Turns out, when you have forwarded exports, you can basically give an RVA that's not within your own module space. It, well, it's going to be within your own module space, but it's going to be outside of the range of the export information. And so it's going to basically point, you'll, you'll have an RVA here, which is going to, instead of pointing at a function, it's going to point at a string, and that string is going to say, actually, this function is implemented in some other DLL. It'll say, like, ntdll dot that function. And so the, the case where it's pointing is a little complicated, so I'll see if I can, whether I, yeah, I think the best way is just to show an example right here. Okay. <clears throat> Yes. So this is sort of the trick that happens with forwarded exports. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the board on this one. And uh, I think I have to draw a little picture for this. Now, throughout the process, we've seen DOS header, NT header, which has file header and has an optional header, optional header, and then it has data directory. Right? So we've got the data directory, and data directory entry zero here points at some exports information. Data directory zero points at exports information that starts with that structure that has you know the few fields. And then it's got the array of export address table, export address table. And then we've got um, export names table, and we've got the name ordinals table. Doesn't matter really what's in there. Point is all those lists and arrays and stuff that I was just showing you, right? And then finally we've got like strings. All that stuff that was on that previous thing, all of that is actually specified by the data directory points to here and the data directory size, the so data directory of data directory of zero dot size is specifying like here's all of my export information. So whereas previously the you know size in these data directories would just kind of point at that first level structure, here the data directory size says I cover all of that information. And what's interesting now is that in the export address table, whereas normally these export address table entries are going to you know, point somewhere into your .text section, they're going to be pointing RVAs at the functions. Where is printf? Where is you know, malloc and things like that? They're pointing somewhere in the code section. If you have an export address table entry that instead points somewhere within this exports base plus size, if it's somewhere in that pointing at one string, that string will say, actually, this export index, you know, five, is over in some other DLL. And then it'll specify the DLL name right there in the strings table. And so that's called a forwarded export. You're saying, I would like to present you with, you know, this name of this function that I export. And then, you know, it's a bait and switch. And you say, oh, actually, some other person implements that. I'm just pretending. So here's an example, and this is from kernel 32. And this is the reason why when we were looking at bound imports, you always saw kernel 32 had number of forwarder refs set to 1, and it said ntdll as that next forwarder ref structure. It's because here's the, here's the export address table of kernel 32. These are the values that are, these are the RBAs pointing somewhere in kernel 32's text section. But then down here, so you can see that most of these RVAs are, you know, at least, well, it's not a good example because they're A something or bigger. But down here, we've got this entry where the RVA is 9100. So over here on this parsed table to the side, PView says, okay, export names. This is all the strings that are associated with that names table. 
And so at 9011, we've got this string that says ntdll.rtl add vector to exception handler. And so PView is trying to just pull that out for you and give it to you nice right here. It says, look, I can tell you that the RVA given right here is somewhere within that size given in the data directory. We're still pointing within my exports information. You're not pointing out to some code somewhere. You're pointing within my exports information. Here's the string that you point at. The string is ntdll.rtl add vector to exception handler. So what happens when the OS loader comes upon this, so you're loading up you know, hello world.exe and it imports from kernel 32. If you happen to import the function add vector exception handler from kernel 32 in your hello world, hello world plus add vector exception handler, OS loader comes along and it's trying to resolve your imports versus kernel 32's exports. And it comes down and it finds this add vector exception handler, you know, it went to the list of names first and then went to the name ordinal. Then it got finally to the export address table. And then what it finds when it gets there is, oh, but well, let me do one last check. Is this RVA pointing within your code somewhere or is this still pointing within your export information? Turns out it's pointing within your export information. So now I need to parse this string, ntdll. Okay, well that's ntdll.dll, it's a separate DLL. Now I need to go import that thing and, and the thing is, I, well, I'm not 100% sure on this actually, but I believe it won't actually, no, no, my task is, I'm 100% sure on this. It will then have to go load up the DLL, ntdll.dll. And so, whereas normally your hello world would just get, you know, a kernel 32 sitting in its memory space, it'll now get kernel 32 and it'll get ntdll. And your import address table entry for that particular function will point down at ntdll because that's the guy that actually implements the code for NT, uh, for RTL add vectored exception handler, which is the behind the scenes, the real function which implements this. So this is actually important. It's like I said, it's a weird corner case. You see it in kernel 32. You don't see it in a lot of normal applications. But what you did see it was Stuxnet. So um, Stuxnet had this Trojan DLL that they were trying to place to basically, again, kind of man in the middle, the functioning of this Step 7 software. So Step 7 was this, I think of it just sort of like a development environment for, for PLC code. So think of it like, you know, Visual Studio, you write up some C code, it gets compiled down to binary code, and then you go off and put that binary somewhere and it runs. Step seven, you're, you know, reconfiguring PLCs, programmable logic controllers. Wait, PLC, I think it's PLC, I don't know why it says TCL, and, but anyways, this is, if it's a, if it's, that's a bug, that's a semantics problem. Notation in the notes. Anyways, you're compiling down some PLC a code that basically is going to tell some hardware how it should actually implement its logic. And so step seven, think of, it, think, think of it like a, you know, Visual Studio environment. Visual Studio is still providing you all these graphics and stuff like that. So Visual Studio depends on a bunch of other DLLs to give you this user interface. And so in this case, there's this other DLL, s 7 otbxdxdll This is the thing which actually implements the code to go and talk to PLCs to write data down to them and say like, here PLC, here's your new, you know, instructions and it reads back code from the PLCs. So the attackers found that, you know, this is the important thing. This is the thing they want to mount in the middle. When they want to, like, hide stuff, they want to get in here so that when you read stuff back from the infected PLC, they give you a clean copy back, right? And so this is the ideal man in the middle case. So what they did was they took the original DLL, renamed it to sx.dll instead of dx.dll, and they made a new DLL which contained their own Trojan code so that when you, when you, when the step seven code called S7 block read, for instance, so it's trying to read a block out of the PLC. When the original code imported this DLL, see, so the, the import address table from this step seven binary is going to look for the, you know, import from the binary, from the DLL S7 OTBXDX, right? That's going to be in the import directory of step seven. They made a Trojan DLL and they moved the original off to the side. So when the OS loader is looking for the VXDX file, it loads up their file instead. And what they did then is they did an analysis of this original file and they said, 
here's the functions which I need to mend in the middle, and then here's a bunch of functions that I don't care about, and I'll just you know let them do their normal thing. For the ones that they wanted to mend in the middle, they implemented that in their Trojan DLL. For the ones they didn't care about, they made their Trojan DLL use forwarded exports to forward down to the original DLL. So basically, their Trojan DLL still gave a big list of like here's all the whatever it was 107 or 109. So this original thing had 109 exports. It says, here's 109 functions I do. The attackers analyzed it, and they saw 93 of those they don't care about. But for the other 13 of those that they do care about, those 16 that they do care about, they said, all right, I'm going to implement those within myself. And for the other 93, I'm just going to do a forwarded export to the original file, which I've copied and renamed. And, and then it'll just call the original code. And I don't need to intercept that in any way. And so this is sort of an interesting use of forwarded exports. And um, yeah, yes. So when they would spoof those reads with it, they would just shoot back like default values, like they, good running conditions. Exactly. They, they were doing. Yep. Exactly. They just send back clean copies of of the of the you know blocks of code. So if you're trying to read in the configure the the actual code that's going to be executed on that PLC, you know you write it in there and then it goes and it executes it. You can read it back and see like is my thing infected? Why is this misbehaving? Right? Sounds Let's go read and analyze our PLCs. And they send back a clean copy of the code and say here you go. So it's less like a Visual Studio thing. You can think of it more like you know it's kind of like Visual Studio. It's kind of like you're attaching a debugger because you've got this read and write you know direct access to the PLC. So it's or analogy, but yes. So that was like for the like the RPMs or whatever. Yes. Yeah, so that was to manipulate the you know presumed uh, presumed centrifuges attached to the PLCs, right? To <coughs> change the way that they were actually behaving so that they break. So <coughs> when people were saying that you know Stuxnet implemented you know a PLC rootkit and stuff like that, the key thing is that they weren't actually doing the hiding and the lying on the piece the PLC itself. That that's sort of more what I would call. PLC rootkit, if the code was on the PLC and when you asked the PLC for the data, even with a clean file environment, even with a clean step seven, if the code to lie was actually in the PLC, that would be sort of more what I would think of. But you know, it's, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. There's an attacker, he's man in the middling, you're trying to read something, he's giving you back a clean copy when it should be dirty. This was implemented at the Windows operating system level. So that's what I should be clear about. Like this is all in a Windows box. The step seven kind of stuff. And then this is some hardware that gets attached to the Windows box. So the man in the middle was happening at the interface between the hardware and the, the physical box, but it was still on the Windows box. All right. And the interesting thing is when I was going back and um, <clears throat> learning about this um, function export uh, redirection, rather. Uh, so I had never dealt with the export redirection until I saw it in the Suxnet paper. I was Googling around and I found this nice article on PacketStorm where it's basically telling you exactly how to create a Stuxnet style Trojan DLL. It's saying, hey, you've got some DLL and you would like to you know, make sure that you implement some functions, but you forward the exports to the original function for other stuff. And that'll tell you how to make the nice.dep file. So you dump all the exports, you put it in a dep file, you say, here's the ones I'm going to do, here's the ones that are forwarded. <coughs> And so that's an interesting tutorial through. All right, and so I already kind of said this. <clears throat> the relevance of forwarded exports to bound imports is that you'll see a number of forwarder refs set to non-zero whenever you import from something that uses forwarded exports anywhere. So if you import from kernel 32 and you bind against kernel 32, because it knows that kernel 32 does some of this forwarding, it knows that, look, kernel 32 might be the same, but NTDLL might change. And NTDLL is the real person implementing some of these functions. So I need to know the versions for both of those because you, know, you could be importing add vector exception handler from kernel 32, but it's really coming in from NTDLL. And so if NTDLL changes, you've got to fix up the bound imports or you have to recalculate them. So that's where this whole bound forward to rep comes from. These are for you know one DLL per thing that this particular binary happens to be forwarding to. NTOS kernel, or sorry, kernel 32.dll only forwards to one thing, and to DLL, that's why you always see one thing immediately after kernel 32. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Can you change the EAT to have a forwarded rep to your 
That's a good question. Can you Deal change up. the EAT to basically do forwarded stuff, right? I would say probably be, well, <coughs> basically the, the key thing is, right, to use forwarded exports, you need to, uh, you could maybe like increase the size and like tack a string there, or you'd have to tack a string over, you'd have to overwrite an existing string, right? So, so that would be another way. Instead of just changing the EAT to like point way out to your module, you change it to point at a forwarded thing, which then would forward to your module. But the, the main question is you've got to get a string somewhere within this range that points to your thing. You can't necessarily overwrite the existing strings. Otherwise, when the OS loader goes to try to look up, you know, some normal export, it'll have the completely wrong string. It'll never find that thing to fill into somebody else's import table, right? If it's looking for edit, edit, uh, whatever it was called, edit, edit open info or whatever it was called, if that string got overwritten, it would never be able to actually import that for somebody else and then it would just crash other programs. So I think the easiest way to go about it would basically be expand the size of that data directory entry and tack a string at the bottom and then you'd have to add an extra export address to it. It would be a lot more work basically, but I think it's doable. Yeah. 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 Y